sitt. Och då du är på är det någon i församlingen som följer oss att de önskar att ta, ta parti med judarna, dela deras skäbne och visa att uh, vi uh, står samman med dig. Så har vi många av dessa märken igen. Har du fri möjlighet till att bära det så uh, vill jag anbefalla att du gör det. Vi kostar 30 kronor och köper du fyra märken så får du det för 100 kronor, alltså 25 kronor stycke. Och jag syns det en fördel att ha det fler, så att jag har festade på alla jackorna mina. De flesta i alla fall. Så att du slipper skifta jackemärke när du skifter jacka. Så då när du tar på dig tröja eller vad som helst så hänger jag på märket där. Och, och det syns jag är väldigt lättvint. Så fyra, fyra sådana märker för 100 kronor. Och jag har med mig en del här som som dere kan få kjøpe. Ta med blad, kjøp eh, ja, Nipsit jakkemerke, en blev. Da går tida, og vi har kommet til klokka halv etterpå. Og vi gleder oss til å høre det neste foredraget av eh, Kainon. Og eh, vi ønsker han hjertelig velkommen iblant oss igjen. Eh, Hearty welcome to our conference again. We're looking forward to hear what you have to say to us, so we give the floor to you now. Thank you. Tusen tak, Bogotov, and uh, thank you for uh, for having me back a second time. Um, what I'm gonna try to do today is I'm gonna try to, or this morning, is to discuss the peace process or the, the diplomatic process and the US-Israeli relationship inside it because that, that's so important uh, to understand everything that's going on is to understand the, the tone and the tenor of the US-Israeli relationship. And it's, it's something I like to call the, the OBB era, right? The, the age of Obama and Bibi Netanyahu, kind of the OBB chapter in, in Israeli-US relationships. A better way, perhaps, to address the issue would be to ask the following question. The Israeli-US honeymoon, is it over? Right? And I, I, I think it's fair to say that, that from the election of President Bill Clinton in 1992, through the two terms of George Bush, there was a honeymoon in Israeli-US relationship. Right? Not that there were not disagreements between the capitals during this period, there were, but the disagreements stayed inside the room. Right? They weren't out there for everybody for the entire world to see. Now, obviously, the situation has changed, and it's changed somewhat dramatically. Right? When the President of the United States, Barack Obama, meets Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu a couple months ago, right? He has a meeting without cameras present, without joint statements available, and as a columnist, as a reporter for the Washington Post wrote, when Obama treats Netanyahu as an unsavory third world dictator, those differences in policy are very much out there for people to see. Now, Obama, to a certain extent, and I'll get to this in a minute, is trying to change the tone of the relationship because he sees it's, it's very difficult. When, oh, when Netanyahu, when Bibi Netanyahu meets Obama on Tuesday in the White House, you can be sure that there's going to be press there, there's going to be photographs, there's going to be a lot of handshakes and smiles, I think because the president understands that he went a little bit, a little bit too far. But the tension, the tension we had in the relationship between Netanyahu and between Obama is not necessarily a surprise, right? Um, indeed, after, after both Obama and Bibi Netanyahu were elected, it was clear that there would be tension since Israel elected a government to the right of its previous government and the U.S. elected a president to the left of the previous president. So when you're making a bridge, right, and you have the pillars on the bridge and you move one pillar to the left and another pillar to the right, then obviously there's gonna be tension on the bridge itself. And I think that's what you've seen over the last year and a half. You've seen tension because the pillars of the bridge have been moved, moved outward. 
by nature, I'm not somebody who's an alarmist, right? In my journalist, I've been a journalist now for about 25 years, and you see a lot of things that at first blush makes you think that, well, this is horrible, this is an earthquake, and then you kind of look at it differently and it's not as bad as it seems. Sometimes as journalists, we have a, we have a tendency to make, you know, to make mountains out of mohills. But I think it would be false for me to say that this is necessarily the case right now of just a little bit of pressure on the bridge between Jerusalem and Washington. The tension between the two governments is considerable, and the tension reveals two main conceptual differences, two main differences of looking at reality between how the present Israeli government looks at the reality and the present government in Washington looks at the reality. And the two conceptual differences, or the two conceptual gaps, are on two basic levels. The first has to do with the region. While Washington believes, very genuinely I think, that solving the Israeli-Palestinian issue is the key to unlocking the door to stability in the whole region and tamping down Iran's influence, Israel says that there can be no stability in the region at all including no Palestinian-Israeli agreement without first neutralizing Iran. Okay, so that's one big area of disagreement between Israel and the U.S. And the second idea is how to solve the Israeli-Palestinian issue. With the U.S. still very much locked into this idea that if you just give land, you're going to get peace in return, right? The land for peace paradigm. And Israel, as I explained the other night, bitten by, by experience, bitten by a bitter reality over the last uh, few years, not at all sure that the land for peace paradigm works. Okay, so you have these two big differences about how we look at reality. A few years back in July of 1989, this was the last time that we saw the degree of tension between a U.S. administration and an Israeli government that we're seeing now. In July of night, this is when George Bush was the U. George Bush, the father, was the U.S. president, and Yitzhak Shamir was the, the prime minister of Israel. And there was an interesting political cartoon in the Jerusalem Post, in my newspaper at the time, which kind of reflected the the strain in the relationship. And this is this is what the cartoonist drew. He had a picture of Shamir. You remember Shamir was a little fellow. He had the picture of Shamir on a boat in a captain's uniform, right? And somebody yelled at him. They said, Captain Shamir, look out. We're sailing straight into the American iceberg. Don't be silly, Shamir said. We're not sailing straight into the American iceberg. The iceberg is sailing into us. And I think that cartoon is very relevant today because the view from Jerusalem is that it's not a change of Israeli policy that has sparked the recent tension with the U.S., but rather a change of American policy. We're not sailing into the iceberg, the iceberg is sailing into us. Netanyahu has not fundamentally altered Israeli policy or moved it sharply to the right, right? If anything, as his decision a few months ago to, to freeze building starts in the settlements is shown, he's taken unprecedented uh, steps in the other direction. Building in East Jerusalem, right, which sparked the recent tension with the U.S., the decision to build that neighborhood, Ramat Shlomo, in East Jerusalem, or to build 1,600 units there. That's not a Bibi Netanyahu policy, right? Building Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem has been the policy of every Israeli government since 1967. So again, it's not as if he were sailing into the iceberg, but the iceberg is sailing into him, and what he's trying to do is figure out how to stay out of its way and keep the ship as whole as he can. Now before I get into that, and to show that I truly am not an alarmist, I wanna, and not one who's necessarily prone to panic, I think it's necessarily, as I said the other night, to again keep things in perspective. Yes, right now the relationship with Washington is tense regarding the diplomatic process, but there is much more to the U.S.-Israeli relationship than just the diplomatic process. Right? The Israeli-U.S. relationship is a rich, multifaceted relationship that cuts across numerous different spheres and numerous different governmental bodies. Even as Obama and Netanyahu disagree very publicly, the U.S. is still providing Israel with $3 billion of military aid each year. 74% of that aid, by the way, that has to be spent in the U.S. Okay, and nobody is talking about tampering with that or touching that aid. 
As we have this disagreement, Israel is still providing the U.S. with critical, critical intelligence information on a real-time basis in the region. The U.S. and Israeli armies right now are cooperating at an unprecedented level. Uh, my son, who's, uh, I mentioned the other night, he's in the paratroopers, a few months ago he came back, he was very excited, he was going to train with the U.S. Army on, a, uh, on an aircraft, share, uh, aircraft carrier off the, off the, off the uh, coast of Haifa. Uh, training the, the Marines in anti-terrorist uh, anti uh, combat, uh, how, to, how to deal with, an, with, with, with terrorists. This unfortunately was a, a drill that was postponed because this was right around the time of the, uh, the earthquake in Haiti and all the U.S. ships had to go over there. But this, this gives you an indication of how close the military relationship is when you have an Israeli soldiers training American soldiers. Obama, President Obama has, has proven himself to be very committed to allowing Israel to retain its qualitative military edge. What does this mean? This means that the U.S. sells a lot of arms to the Arabs, right? The U.S. just finished a, under the Bush term, the U.S. sold $20 billion worth of, uh, of, 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 of superior arms to Saudi Arabia. What Israel is concerned about is that if you sell them arms, you have to give us kind of the next step up so that we're able to deal with those arms. It's called the, the qualitative military edge, and that's something that Obama has continued to do. Right? The U.S. under Obama was very forceful in rejecting the Goldstone Report. Right? It stood by Israel's side in the international forum at the U.N. over the Goldstone, uh, Goldstone Report. So again, the sky is not falling. All is not dark. The U.S. is not on the verge of cutting off Israel. In fact, over the last couple of weeks, you've seen a dramatic change in tone coming from Washington. Right? The White House apparently came to the conclusion that the very public anger towards Israel was both raising expectations from the Palestinians that they would be able, the U.S. would be able to deliver Israel on a silver platter, and it was also endangering important Jewish political support inside the U.S. Right? President Obama, the Democratic Party, is facing a very tough election in November, and it's not this time, this is not the time that they need now to antagonize Jewish voters. Right? In November, the U.S. goes and they, they vote in all the congressmen, the, all the senators. They don't want to antagonize Jewish voters, and more importantly, they don't want to antagonize Jewish contributors to the party, right? Even though, as we have seen, the American Jews do not vote primarily for candidates only based on what they think about Israel, but rather on domestic issues, enough of them do take Israel into consideration when they go to the polls to get the administration to worry that they might now be just pushing Israel too far and losing key key Jewish support, right? There, was, there were two important polls recently. One showed that, that the Jews in November of 2008 voted for, for Obama, 78%. 78% of the Jews voted for Obama. A recent poll found that 67% of American Jews disapprove of Obama's handling of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and 42% said they would consider voting for somebody else. That's not something that is lost completely on the administration. But even more importantly, I think it's important to note that in the Democratic Party, between, between about 40 to 50 percent of the big donors, those who give over $25,000 per election cycle to the Democratic Party, are Jews. And for many of these people, Israel is extremely important. So again, I think this is something that the administration took into consideration and is one of the reasons that we're seeing a real change in tone over the last few weeks. Right? How do we see that change in tone? Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, Dennis Ross, James Jones, the National Security Advisor, all these people went to Jewish events and spoke about the relationship. Rahm Emanuel, who's the most powerful man in Washington outside of Obama, he spoke to uh, groups of Jewish rabbis. He's now in Israel, or he was in Israel last week, having a bar mitzvah for his son. And now Obama has invited Netanyahu back to Washington. Netanyahu is going to go to Washington on Tuesday after going to Canada, right? And I think all this shows you to the degree to which the administration realizes that they have to, they have to kind of tone back their level of discord towards Israel, right? The good news is that the administration realizes that they need to change the tone, and that's important, right? An antagonistic, a confrontational, an angry tone from Washington. 
has allowed for a couple things. It's allowed the Palestinians to a large degree to dig in their heels and hesitate to go to negotiations. This antagonistic tone has kept the Arab world from having to do anything on its side, make any gestures towards Israel. And the antagonistic tone has also given free reign to Europe to kind of step up its criticism of Israel at every opportunity, right? When, when certain governments in Israel, uh, certain, I'm sorry, certain governments in Europe, when they see the United States of America, Israel's best friend in the world, beating up on Israel publicly, then they kind of feel more freedom themselves to step up their level of criticism. Um, I heard a, a high-ranking official in the, foreign minister, in the foreign ministry say last week that the U.S. has more impact on the and the tone and tenor of Israeli-European ties than Israel does, right? The, the, the EU, to a large extent, looks at Israel and gets their cue, uh, looks at the U.S. and gets their cue from the U.S. on what level of ties they should have with Israel. So the good news is that the American public tone towards Israel has changed. Has changed. Um, the bad news, however, is that there still does remain these deep gaps in our perception of reality, right? That we do indeed see the world or the region quite differently. On Friday night, I summarized that mindset and tried to explain how our view of reality stems from our concern for security and how the 17 years since the beginning of the Oslo process has convinced so many of us that the idea of land for peace, the paradigm, the land for peace paradigm, doesn't work. And that insecurity, which I described, has been felt by everyone over the last decade. And like I said then, it explains a lot about Israeli policy. Now, if you take, for instance, the issue of Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem is, a, is an extremely hot topic right now. It's, uh, it's, it's very much at the center of the, the tension between Israel and the U.S. The U.S. Is, has formally always opposed Israel's building in Jerusalem, right? But it never lumped the building there inside Jerusalem with building beyond the Green Line in the West Bank. It seemed always to make a certain degree of distinction between the building in Jerusalem and the building in the settlements. There's oftentimes abroad, there is a, there is a, a sense of taking all the settlements. You, know, you hear the word settlements, you take them all and you dump them into a basket and you say they're all alike. Right? Well, they're not all alike. I'll get that into a minute. And Israelis and the Americans up until now have distinguished between building in the West Bank and building in the settlements. There's also something else to keep in mind when looking at Jerusalem. And this goes back to what I said the other night about how all Israelis view things through the, the glasses of how it impacts on our own security. Many, many people, many Europeans, many Americans look at the whole Jerusalem issue and say, it's so simple, right? It's so logical. Take the city, as Bill Clinton wanted to do when he came up with his bridging proposals in 2000, and just divide the city logically according to demographics, right? The Jewish parts, or, or the, the part where the Jews goes to Israel, the part where their Arabs go to the Palestinians, right? It sounds logical, it sounds rational. Forget a minute about the issue, that, the centrality that Jerusalem has had for 3,000 years to the Jewish people, that this was always the, the site of the longings and the aspirations of the Jews even when they lived abroad. Forget about that for a minute. What goes through the minds of Israelis when they hear this idea, just divide the city, is also another consideration. And that if you do that, if you lop off the Arab neighborhoods, if you again divide the city, you will again have snipers on the rooftops of the Notre Dame or in the rooftops of certain places inside the Palestinian areas who will again start, stop, start firing upon the Israelis on the other side, as was the case before 1967. Now for those people who say, what are you talking about? This is not 1967, we're 40 years down the road. This is paranoid. paranoid. Look what happened at the beginning of the Intifada, when the, the second Intifada started in September 2000, when the neighborhood of Gilo was coming under sniper fire from a neighborhood just across the valley called, called Beit Jala, right? And that only stopped when the IDF went back in there. So when you, th these things, you know, this is all very real and fresh to a lot of people in Israel. And again, it illustrates the different perceptions of, the, uh, of reality between Israel and the US and how differently we approach the diplomatic process. The US will say, it's easy to solve Jerusalem. Israelis who have the experience of the last few years, right, realize that if you do divide the city, there are all kinds of security situations that we're gonna face then that we don't face now. And that also plays heavily on our mind. 
And allow me now, please, to look at, at, at the diplomatic process that we've just started, focusing on three major players, on the three major players, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, President Barack Obama, and the President of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen. While Netanyahu, while, while Prime Minister Netanyahu wants to change the paradigm of how to make pay, peace, change the whole formula, Obama is locked into the traditional U.S. way of looking at the problem through the land for peace glasses, right? And Abu Mazen, uh, Mahmoud Abbas sees an opportunity here to change the paradigm parameters, to change the parameters of the game altogether, and instead of negotiating a solution with Israel, getting a solution imposed on both sides from the outside. Netanyahu's basic position is that the paradigms, the way we've been doing business over the last 17 years since the beginning of the Oslo process, have, simply put, just not worked. You don't get the sides together into a room until white smoke emerges from a chimney and an agreement comes after a certain predetermined amount of time, right? It's not like you get everybody down, you say you have to have an agreement in two years and you have an agreement in two years. What Bibi says is that the formula, the paradigm needs to change. Goodbye to the idea of a dramatic quick fix solution. Hello to the idea of applauding reality change. It's harder, it's less sexy, but if you want the process to work, Netanyahu says, you have to do things now much differently than you've done it in the past. Right? His first premise is that if Abu Mazen, if the Palestinians turn down what Ehud Olmert offered him two years ago, which is roughly 94% of the land, a few thousand refugees allowed to come back, half of Jerusalem, no sovereignty over the Holy Basin, the Temple Mount area, right? If he refused that, then there's nothing in the world that he could accept that Netanyahu would give. What could Netanyahu give more than that that he could accept, right? That's his premise. That's where Bibi is coming from. Indeed, he argues, the terms of reference about how you go about making peace have to change. Now, what does that mean? First, it means that you need to better define your terms. We all talk now about a Palestinian state, about a need for a two-state solution. But what does a Palestinian state mean? What is that? For Netanyahu, it means an entity that will not be a state in the full meaning of the word. Right? It can have a flag, it can have an anthem, it can have tax collectors, it can have police forces, but it cannot have certain trappings that could endanger Israel's security. It can't be a state in the, in, in the same manner in which, for instance, Norway is a state. Right? What can't it have? It can't have an army. It'll need to be demilitarized. It can't have complete control over its borders because we see what happened in Gaza. They have control over the borders in Gaza and you have all these arms coming into Gaza from Egypt which are threatening, very much threatening Israel. And it can't have the ability to sign treaties with other countries. Because what happens if Israel creates a Palestinian state on its border and the next morning that state says we are now in an alliance with Iran? that we have a little bit of a problem, right? Secondly, Netanyahu says, this new Palestinian state must recognize Israel as a Jewish state, right? Must recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Now, many people abroad will hear that and they say, what are you doing? Right? What do you need this for? Why are you throwing this into the mix, right? You don't know you're a Jewish state. You need the Palestinians to recognize you as a Jewish state for you to know that you're a Jewish state. The reason this is so important for, for, for Netanyahu is that unless or until the Palestinians and the Arab world recognize that Israel has a right to be there as a Jewish state, then even if you, solve, if, even if you sign an agreement, you're not going to solve the conflict once and for all, right? Israel's concern is that the Palestinians do not recognize that we too have a right to be in the region. And that what's going to happen is they're going to pocket any agreement. They're going to pocket the agreement and then they're going to move on to further demands. This is something that's known in Israel as the receding horizon syndrome or moving the goalpost backwards, right? And we've had experience with this. The best experience or the most recent experience we had was in, uh, in 2000 when Israel completely left Lebanon. Israel withdrew from Lebanon unilaterally in 2000. We withdrew up to the point where the United Nations, which isn't exactly our greatest cheering section in the world, the United Nations said you withdrew. What happened the next day? The very next day Hezbollah stood up and said you didn't withdraw. 
We still have claims. We're not going to put down our arms because you haven't left the Sheba Farms area. You haven't left seven villages inside northern Israel. It's not over. So again, there's this idea that, that we have in Israel that no matter what you do, it's not going to be enough, which is why they have to say, yes, we do recognize you have a right to be here as a Jewish state. <clears throat> The third parameter that, that Netanyahu wants to change is that he wants to get the Arab states involved in the peace process from the very beginning, right? The Oslo process, the Camp David process in 2000 were all done bilaterally between Israel and the Palestinians, and they didn't work. They didn't work. And I think one reason that some in Jerusalem feel they didn't work is that because the Arabs did not give the tailwind. Oop, they didn't give a backwind or a tailwind to the Palestinians to allow them to make an agreement. We saw this at Camp David. At a certain point in Camp David, Ehud Barak, who was the prime minister at the time, he put a, 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 an idea, a formula on Jerusalem, about dividing Jerusalem on the table. Arafat said, I can't make the decision on Jerusalem alone. I have to go back to the Arabs and see what they say. He went back to the Egyptians. He went back to the Saudis, right? And they said, no, you can't sign this. So Bibi says, we can't work like this. You have to get the Arab countries signed on the dotted line in the beginning if you want this process to work. The Palestinians have to know that they have Arab support to sign an agreement which is going to necessitate not only compromises from Israel, we're going to have to compromise, but also compromises from the Palestinians. Right? We're not all going to get everything we want. And the Arabs have to give the Palestinians uh, a, a, a guarantee in the beginning, before the process starts, that they are willing to, to recognize that that's going to be the case. And the final frame of reference I think that Bibi wants to change has to do with what is known uh, as the bottom-up approach to peacemaking, right? Up until now, the idea that we've had was that leaders, the leaders will sign an agreement and that everything will follow, right? Arafat and, and Rabin are going to sign an agreement and peace is going to flow like a river, right? Like it does elsewhere in the world, right? There's other conflicts in the world. The leaders sign an agreement and peace follows, right? Along comes Netanyahu and he says, look, it didn't work. It didn't work. You didn't sign an agreement with the leaders and the peace did not follow. You have to build the peace upward as well. It's not enough for it to come down. It has to come from the ground up. So he says, let's work hard on the economy. Let's improve the situation on the ground so the people, the Palestinians, will have something to lose if when you get in a point where you're negotiating right, and you hit a brick wall and you're going to hit a brick wall, if you get to that point, then they're not going to say, let's resort to violence. They're going to say, let's find a way to work this out because they have something to lose. You have to give them something that they have to lose. Now, we saw something very interesting after Vice, uh, Vice President Joe Biden came to Israel a couple months ago and you got into this whole big uh, argument over the decision to build these 1,600 units in Ramat Shlomo. Right after that period, there was an up. We're talking about like a day after. There was an uptick. There was an increase all of a sudden in violence in Jerusalem. Right? There was there were there were violent protests. There were there were rocks being thrown again. There was a, a shooting incident. It seemed to a certain degree that we were very much much on the cusp of perhaps a third intifada. And there was a lot of news reports saying, are we on the cusp of a third intifada? I remember writing about it myself. But you saw something interesting happen on the ground. Although there were calls from the Palestinian leadership to take to the streets again, right, the calls did not resonate. People didn't answer the calls. Right? They weren't interested in a violent confrontation at the time. And I think that's interesting because you have to ask yourself, why not? What happened? And I think to a large extent what happened is, well, the life in the Palestine, in the West Bank right now is much better than it was a couple of years ago, and people don't necessarily want to risk that and again go to a violent, a violent confrontation. Now, Netanyahu took all these ideas that I just talked about and he packaged them into one speech he gave last summer at Bar Ilan University. And in so doing, this is a famous speech, it's called the Bar Ilan speech. In so doing, I think he very much articulated Israeli consensus public opinion. People often, I know in Europe, also in the US, people often criticize Netanyahu for not initiating anything, right? For not having a plan. Well, this is his plan. A Jewish state alongside a demilitarized Palestinian state, one with the major settlement blocks and Jerusalem in Israeli control, and with the Arab world both recognizing Israel as a Jewish state and getting involved in the peace process itself from the very beginning. Right? People might not like his plan, right? but that's his plan. 
That's his plan. It might not be enough for many people, but to say he doesn't have a plan, I don't think, I don't think is accurate. An important philosophical underpinning behind his whole approach to this, to, uh, uh, behind Netanyahu's whole approach is that the last 16 years, starting with Oslo, shows that the Palestinians, the Arabs have not yet, as I said the other night, come to grips with the existence of Israel of any Jewish state in the region anywhere. It's not necessarily a matter of borders, but the very existence of the state there. There is no confidence among the Israeli government right now, and as the elections show, very little confidence among the people that this is, like I said, a territorial conflict. Increasingly, there's a sense that no matter what you do or what you give up, it's not going to be enough because the core issue is not about the land where Israel should exist or the borders where it should exist, but whether it should exist at all. And the Palestinians, unfortunately, have done nothing really to convince us, the country, the Israelis, of the contrary. So instead of waiting for that attitude to change, something that may take generations, right? It's, a long, it's going to take a long time to change attitudes. Netanyahu's approach is bottom up change the reality on the ground and in the process hope and pray that perhaps this will change the attitude of the people as well. Now the obvious problem with this is that it takes time, right? We're talking about changing attitudes, that's hard and that takes time. We're not talking here about peace now. We're not talking here about peace tomorrow. We're not talking here about a quick fix, about coming with a, an agreement, snapping your fingers and it's all over, right? This is a more, it's a longer, it's a more, metho, metho, uh, a more prolonged and more difficult process. And again, it's about managing the conflict rather than all of a sudden wanting to solve it right away. And the world, especially Obama, doesn't have time, doesn't have time for this. Obama, for various ne reasons, needs immediate results for a couple of key reasons. First of all, he wants to see results because of the considerable efforts he's already expended in the region. Right? If you work hard on something, you want to see the fruits of your labors. Uh, secondly, there's a belief that an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians will assist the U.S.'s efforts, will assist President Obama in getting U.S. troops out of Iraq and Afghanistan. His idea being that the, Arab, that the moderate Arab regimes who he needs to get the troops out will help more if there is an Israeli-Palestinian agreement. Obama also believes that an Israeli-Palestinian agreement would create a regional coalition willing to help much more deal with Iran. Right? In this idea, solving the Israeli-Palestinian issue is the key for Obama to solving so much more, so much else. Israel rejects that premise. It, 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 it disagrees with the notion that cobbling together or putting together a regional coalition to deal with Iran is going to be easier if you have an Israeli-Palestinian uh, agreement. The Arab world, the way we see it in Jerusalem, is petrified of Iran, perhaps more petrified of Iran than we are. But its unwillingness to take a stand on the issue publicly doesn't necessarily have to do with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, but because it really doesn't know what the U.S. is going to do. Right? If you're the, 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 the king of Qatar or the, uh, the emir of Kuwait, and you're sitting there with Iran on your shoulder wondering whether or not they're going to get nukes, right? you will take a stand against them if you know that the U.S. is going to be there. Right? But if you don't know if the U.S. is going to be there, then you're going to be very hesitant about taking a stand. And I think to a large extent, that's what we've seen over the last few years. The way we see it in Israel is that Iran is the source of all instability in the region. And until you hit the source, there will be no stability. You cannot look anywhere in the Middle East, look anywhere where there's violence in the Middle East, be it in Lebanon, be it in Yemen, be it in Israel, anywhere without seeing the fingerprints of Iran. Right? So, so what we think is that if you want to stabilize the region, first neutralize Iran. Iran has tentacles in the region, in our immediate region, Hamas and Hezbollah, and if you don't strike them first, if you don't neutralize them, nothing, nothing at all will work. Um, according to this point of view, right, and I think it's a, it's a dominant point of view right now in Jerusalem, let's say that you could sign on a peace agreement tomorrow with Abu Mazen, right? Abu Mazen and Netanyahu get together and they sign a peace agreement. 
The Finland and Israel, the Iranians are not going to let that peace agreement work. They're not going to sit back and clap their hands and say, oh, it's wonderful, the Israelis and Palestinians are going to finally have peace. They're going to want to stop that agreement because stability in the region is not in their interest. That's not they, what they want. And unfortunately, they have a couple proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah, who they can send into the game whenever they want to try to, to, mess up, to mess up any kind of peace process. The Obama administration, and again, this is a, a, how we view reality a bit differently. The Obama administration argues the reverse. The, they, they, they argue the opposite. That an Israeli-Palestinian agreement would pull the rug out from under the feet of Hamas and Hezbollah, that they would have no more reason to exist, right? Because there would be peace, they wouldn't have to exist. And that, by the way, again, that is a very major conceptual difference between how Netanyahu views the world and how Obama views the world. Now, this brings me now uh, briefly to, to Obama. I'm not discovering America here, or I'm not discovering the world, when I say that Israel's relationship with the Obama administration has been very, very difficult and rocky from the very beginning. And I think there are two fundamental reasons for that. I think Obama misread and continues to misread the Israeli public, and I think he also misread the Arab world. First, regarding the Israeli public. There are two basic assumptions of the Obama administration from the very beginning, from the day he took office. He had two basic assumptions regarding Israel. Number one was that the Israeli public, who understands the importance of the U.S.-Israeli relationship to its very existence, the Israeli public will never tolerate a government that is going to lead into a diplomatic confrontation with the U.S. Right? That's assumption number one. And his ass second assumption was that the Israeli public disliked, intensely disliked the settlements. Right? And as a result of those two assumptions, the administration from the very beginning decided to push very, very hard on the settlement issue, calling for a complete and absolute total freeze, thinking that, look, the Israelis didn't like the settlements anyhow, and they're not going to want to get into any kind of diplomatic confrontation with the U.S. over that issue. But both of his assumptions, I think, were misguided. First of all, I think it's important to note Israelis do not hate all settlements. Like I said earlier, you can't take all the settlements, dump them into a bucket and say Israel doesn't like any of these. Israel makes distinctions. Israelis might not like the hardcore, very religious, ideological settlements, but the settlements like Gush Etzion or Mali Adumim, the main settlement blocks where the vast majority of Israelis live, Israelis do not dislike. And the Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem, which the world considers settlements, but we in Israel do not, they don't, they don't dislike that. Right? There's been an Israeli consensus about those areas, areas for years. So when Obama says that all settlement construction has to be halted everywhere, he appears to the Israelis to be making very unreasonable demands on Israel at a time when he is giving the Palestinians in Abu, Mas, uh, Abu Mazen a free pass. Right? Pressing the subject last year did not bring the Israeli public, as I think Washington thought it would, it did not bring the Israeli public to rally around Obama. Right? We've had now difficult relations with the U.S. for the last couple of months, right? and Netanyahu's poll numbers have gone up and not down. Right? Sipi Livni is not on the verge of taking over the government. Obama, I think, made two other critical mistakes concerning Israel. The first was at the very